What's happening? Welcome to the Matt Bernier Show, part of the In the Money Media Network. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on X or Twitter or whatever the hell you want to call it, at Bernier underscore Matt. And I will tell you this, as long as it stays free, if I have to pay for it, if FanDuel wants to pay for it, that's up to them. I refuse to pay a dollar for that. And my friend on uh, in the comments on YouTube, it's not because I hate Elon Musk. It's just because there's a bunch of nonsense out there. The, the platform itself, very good. If I got to pay for it, not so good. Uh, today is Friday, September the 22nd, 2023. It's episode 173 of the pod. However you listen, thank you for doing so. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, in the moneypodcast.com. Also, YouTube, search bar, Matt Burning your show. You'll get this episode along with the 172 prior. As always, please rate, review, subscribe, thumbs up, thumbs down, comments, uh, feedback, you name it. But make sure you're subscribed on the, the podcast feeds. So you get notified when new content has been uploaded, whether it's this show, whether it's the Players Pod, whether it's JK Plus One, whether it's Horse Players Happy Hour, whatever it may be, that goes for the podcast feeds, that goes for YouTube as well. Um, And again, feedback is really important, Uh, for better or for worse. If there's something that you don't like from us, if there's something that you do like from us, you want to hear more of, let us know. And everyone within the money media does their best to try to deliver this week's show Looking ahead to Saturday, and I say ahead, it's tomorrow afternoon. I'm going to head to the airport in a few hours to head down to Philadelphia, getting ready for the big day of racing at Parks, the Grade 1 Pennsylvania Derby, the Grade 1 Cotillion. I will give you thoughts on both of those races briefly. We'll start off with a little bit of a different piece, and we'll wrap up the show with projections coming up for this uh, week three, I guess it would be. Yeah, week three for the NFL. Thursday night football is come and gone. 49ers win 30 to 12. I had 29 to 20 as a projection, so a little bit of a miss there. But um, and I appreciate. I see you. I'm reading the the comments. CJ Andrews, two nine five eight on YouTube. I don't know if you're on any of the other social platforms. If you're on Twitter or anything else, I feel very good about this. The quote or the comment. Goes on a rant about game ending in a tie, dot, dot, dot. Game proceeds to end in a tie. That's gold right there, folks. Absolute gold. Yes, I feel very good. I feel vindicated. You don't have, you can, you can bet these games three way. They can end in a tie. I said 21, 21 or 22, 22, whatever it was. Game ended in a tie last week. And guess what? I got another projection for a tie this week. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but something to think about. Something to think about. So we'll have projections at the end of the show for the rest of week number three in the National Football League. Before we get to the Cotillion, before we get to the Pennsylvania Derby, word from our friends at the Breeders' Cup. We're thrilled to be partnered again with the Breeders' Cup for 2023. Next weekend, the win in your in action really heats up with 12 Challenge Series races happening across the globe. Friday, September the 29th, and Saturday, September the 30th, hold a pair of two-year-old turf races from Newmarket, with Saturday also featuring three domestic stakes across Aqueduct, Churchill Downs, and Santa Anita. Sunday, October the 1st, is a feature day for international stars with five Challenge Series races happening at Longchamp, including the prestigious Qatar Prix del Arc de Triomphe. Additionally, all entry fees for the winners will be covered, and a $10,000 reward goes to the nominator. Be sure to stay tuned to In the Money Media for all of your Breeders' Cup coverage. The Breeders' Cup Challenge Series win, and you are in, and we are at the bitter end, folks. You got about five-ish weeks? Let me double-check. One, two, three, four, five, six weeks until the Breeders' Cup out at Santa Anita. So if you haven't qualified for the Breeders' Cup betting challenge, if you haven't been... I I would strongly encourage you to start looking at the international contingent or try to get a read on some of them. The ARC, occasionally we see horses come over. I have no idea what the weather looks like in Paris next week. But if you've got a horse that really wants firm going and maybe it's going to be less than firm at Longchamp, maybe they come over here. Maybe the Japanese send something over. I... It would be fabulous if it was Equinox. I haven't read anything on that recently. I know early season that was kind of a thought, but we'll see. It's a great, great weekend, this weekend and next weekend, but we are getting closer and closer to the big one. The Breeders' Cup World Championships out at Santa Anita. I mentioned we're going to talk about both the Cotillion and the Pennsylvania Derby. One a little more vague than the other. But let's start off with the Cotillion 
and specifically pretty mischievous. I brought this up with Ilman a few weeks ago when he was kind enough to be on the pod. If Archangelo wins the classic, he's horse of the year. There's no there's no real drama there. If White Abario wins, he's probably horse of the year with a Whitney classic double. If Mage wins the classic, he's horse of the year. Arabian Knight and Go Rocket Ride, it's probably close. A, a Haskell classic double or a Pacific classic classic double. Maybe a little bit of a harder sell, but not much. Not much. But I threw out another name, and assuming... Again, I think there's only one horse that, with a win in the Classic, is a slam dunk. No no second guessing. And that's Archangelo. He's the only one that I believe kind of controls his fate, for Horse of the Year honors anyway. If he doesn't win, I just laid out a few horses that you can make the argument for. But what if... Saturday at Parks, pretty mischievous over what looks like it's going to be an absolute swamp. Unfortunately, Mother Nature is not going to cooperate with us on Saturday. If pretty mischievous wins the cotillion, and then she comes back and she wins the Breeders' Cup distaff, assuming that's where they go with her. And her resume in 2023 is victories in the Kentucky Oaks, grade one, the Acorn, grade one, the Test, grade one, with the obvious asterisk, the Cotillion, a grade one, the Breeders' Cup Distaff, grade one, over the likes of Nest and Clarier and Idiomatic and anybody else you want to throw in there. Oaks, Acorn, Test, Cotillion, Distaff, five grade ones, defeating both her own age group and older fillies and mares, and winning between seven eighths and nine furlongs. I... At the very least, if she does that, I don't know how you can argue her not being a finalist. Maybe she doesn't win. Maybe you don't think that's good enough. And the Classic is the glamour group of the Breeders' Cup. But what else could you possibly ask for if she were to do that? Ever since they put blinkers on, she's been a different animal. And having said all this, her test, I don't think was all that strong, if we're being honest. We all know the terrible situation there. She should have lost. But even if you scrub the test from her PPs, Kentucky Oaks, the Acorn, the Cotillion, and the Distaff, should she win all of those races? That's a Horse of the Year finalist. I don't care what happens the rest of the way. It just becomes that much more interesting because everyone else has just kind of been bleh. They just... Maybe with the exception of Archangelo. He's really been the most consistent horse from start to finish. With wins in the Belmont and the Travers and the Peter Pan leading into the Belmont. So, uh, to me, she might be the, the storyline for Saturday at Parks, in my opinion. Aside from the starter allowance, which goes as race number four. Because that race is just... Uh, it's a fantastic race. It's a full field. And you have got these starter allowance types. I believe it's a, a 10 starter allowance. Yeah. I mean, th these are horses. I would say at least five of them are capable of earning a, an 88 or a 90 buyer speed figure. It's a great race. Neither here nor there. Everybody's focused on the graded stakes. It's going to be a wet track. She's going to need to stretch back out in distance. And I think she's taking on some pretty good runners. But if she adds the grade one cotillion to her resume, and then she's able to come back and let's say she wins the distaff. How do you not look at Pretty Mischievous and say she is obviously a finalist for Horse of the Year, but man, that is a, that's a pretty stout resume, isn't it? It would be five grade ones, including the Kentucky Oaks and the Breeders' Cup distaff. I would have a difficult time. I'm not currently a voter. I'm sure... I don't know if it'll change for this upcoming year, but it'll probably change in the near future. And I haven't voted in years, going back to my time with the racing form. But to me, that's a horse of the year resume. Archangelo winning the Classic probably outweighs it. 
a Belmont Travers Classic Triple. If he wins the Classic decisively, it probably, you know, the, the argument really ends there. But if he doesn't win, and it's one of these other horses that I just mentioned, whether it's White Abario or it's, you know, or let's throw, throw Cody's Wish into the mix. Let's say he wins the Dirt Mile. All right, he's, he's padding his stats a bit, but I, I don't think... To me, when he lost the Whitney and they're not going two turns, he may be the most talented horse, but I think it takes him out of the running for horse of the year, just from a prestige standpoint. You know, Forte winning the Classic, I don't think a Florida Derby Breeders' Cup Classic is enough. I don't think that double is enough. Mage? Mage? Oh. So, all right, here's, here's, let's use Mage as the, the kind of barometer. If you were a voter, let me know on Twitter or beneath the video player on YouTube. If you were a voter, and let's just hypothetically say Mage wins the Breeders' Cup Classic, and let's say Pretty Mischievous wins the Cotillion, and let's say she wins the Breeders' Cup Distaff. Does a Kentucky Derby Breeders' Cup Classic double outweigh the superfecta of the Kentucky Oaks, the Acorn, the Test, the Cotillion, and the Breeders' Cup Distaff? I don't think it does, but I recognize that the Derby holds more sort of sway in terms of voters. Whether it should or shouldn't is beside the point. But I, I think Pretty Mischievous has a very compelling case to not just be a finalist. It would be criminal if she wasn't a finalist, with the caveat that I still think she needs to win at least one more, but probably both of those races. But if she wins both of these last races on her schedule, it would be criminal if she wasn't a finalist, and I, I would be very hard-pressed not to vote for her as Horse of the Year, assuming Archangelo doesn't win the Classic. Now, the race itself. I'm saying all of this, and I'm not picking her, and I'm not betting her. I'm hopeful that she gets overbet in here. She's 2-1 to one on the line. I hope people look at all the grade one wins and they go kind of crazy on her because I like occult, the five, a lot to the point where this is my, you know, my, my new found way of going about things over the past seven months, eight months has been try to get alive in a pick three or a pick four or a pick five or a pick six to one horse that I like that I think is going to be an overlay, just projecting and smash it. So, Unfortunately, the, let's say, race, okay, it doesn't matter. Those two turf races, I I'm, I have not even looked at them, and I won't look at them until probably tomorrow morning, on Saturday morning, because I will be stunned. I shouldn't say stunned, but it looks really bad weather-wise. I'd be very surprised if we were on the turf for those two. But good news, leading into the Cotillion, there is a pick three that is the Park Start Mile, the Gallant Bob, which is a grade two, and then the Cotillion. So if I'm going to go single stone cold with a Colt in the payoff leg, then it's a matter of how do I best get there? You know, I think a lot of people are going to just look at Gunite and, and put a ring around him and say he's going to win the dirt mile. So maybe that's an opportunity for me to spread a little bit or use some other horses. Wheel and Springs intrigues me. He's got to get faster, but I, I don't know that I think he is miles behind Gunite. And he's going to be a considerably better price. So he is absolutely one that I'm going to use. My fear is that Nimitz class is going the wrong way from a form standpoint. Um, Dr. Ardito, I think, is a really nice New York bred. I don't know if I quite think he's up to this level, but, you know, you can make the case. And then, truth be told, if you're just purely looking at some figures, I know he was a million to one last out, but Civil War's last race, I don't know where it came from, but that makes him a, gives him a puncher's chance. But primarily, I'm looking at Whelan Springs and Gunite there. Then you get into the six furlong race, the Gallant Bob. This is the one where I think you can really get creative. Uh, I'm, most of my money probably goes through Damon's Mound on the heels of that big victory at Charlestown going two turns. That was a pace meltdown, if I've ever seen one, and he still drew off. I know it was two turns. His six furlong, you know, he hasn't gone six in seven starts back to his debut but I, I think that last race was was extremely strong but it's not as though it's him and everyone else I think this is a really competitive group so 
basically it's going to be for me the the framework of the main plays and as always i'm going to probably have four or five tickets and, and tier them stagger them a little bit maybe i have 100 to 200 into this pick three sequence total but it's going to be very narrow for the mains at the top i'll probably use more than a handful in that second leg and just try to get to a cult knowing that even if she comes down from the six to one morning line in the multis she's going to probably play i think more than she should put it that way with pretty mischievous in the race and then there's other names in that race too you know ceiling crusher is she going to get back coming in from california she's got giant speed figures she's got giant margins of victory she's going to be speed maybe she gets bet who's your Phillies a name that people love maybe she gets bet in there defining purpose is a grade one winner i love defining purpose but i just i like a cult more in this spot so you know you can go a few a few different ways in here just catherine's got some fast figs i don't know if she classes up but you know she's far from impossible in here so that's my approach for the cotillion. I'm going with a cult, and I'm going to try to get alive to her in big pick threes, and hopefully we can hit something decent. You know, she's six on the line. I didn't. I have not priced the race out. If I had to ballpark it, what, what does she go off at? Four to one? I think she's going to take a little bit of money. Let's say Pretty Mischievous goes off at eight to five. I could see eight to five and I could see four to one on a cult with a couple of those other Phillies, you know, chop them up. Maybe a cult's the third choice at four to one. That's just a, a hunch. And again, I have not done the full soup to nuts as far as pricing it out, but I like a cult. Now, the the more vague of the two grade ones for me is the Pennsylvania Derby. I, I still don't know which direction I'm gonna go. If you're just a numbers player. It's Saudi Crown. My concern with Saudi Crown is the potential of the pace scenario. He's probably the speed of the speed, but it's not as though Magic Tap is slow. It's not as though Gilmore is slow, stretching back out in distance. Il Miracolo is not slow. And Reincarnate, his wins have come when he's been on the lead. I will tell you one thing. I'm not picking Reincarnate. I know that for a fact. I don't want anything to do with him. Is he a fine horse? Yes. I've never been a huge fan of his. I think he's okay and just okay. That's my opinion. Could be wrong. I've never been a fan. Saudi Crown, I think, is very talented. You know, He's run into a couple of good horses um, I don't think much of Fort Bragg, who beat him two starts back, and then Forte came back and kind of flopped in the Travers, but Disarm then came out of that race to run a good second. I, I've always been a fan of Magic Tap. I think there's a lot of ability there. He's paired up by our tops of 96. I do wonder that he defeated Film Star, who came back and won next out. There was also a next out winner coming out of that August 13th race at Saratoga as well. Film Star effectively paired up the 95s. I think... If I'm just ballparking it, I think you probably need, I'd say like a 102 to win this race, somewhere thereabouts. So can Magic Tap jump up six points? Absolutely. I'll be interested to see what Tyler does and how this horse is ridden. Il Miracolo, the fig is really nice for the Smarty Jones. He was getting out bad down the lane, and I, I just I don't love that. That alone is going to be enough for me to probably fade him. But I, I won't fault anyone that goes that direction because he is fast. Kroopy is kind of weird because I like he's the kind of horse that I, I don't want in here, but I could see him running far better than maybe the paper would suggest. Um, Gilmore, I don't think this is really truly a route horse. That's just my feel. West Coast Cowboy, he could be going at Remington. I also don't know that I think he's quite this good. Daydreaming Boy, I think, is slow. Dreamlike, I've never been thrilled with. The blinkers come off again. It does feel like Todd is continuing to try to f totally un unlock this horse. Like, he knows there's something there. He's been fast from day one. He's just kind of not quite lived up to expectation. Modern era, I don't have anything to say. Which leaves us with one horse. 
if I bet Scotland at seven to one against Archangelo, Disarm, Tappet Trice, Forte, whoever else was in that field, Mage, National Treasure, I don't know that he's going to be six to one, but how do I not back him here again? Say he's going to be nine to two. If I took sevens against all of those horses and none of them are here, how can I not take nine to two or five to one on him here? He went to the lead in the Curlin, set the pace, drew off. Il Miracolo comes back, wins the Smarty Jones. He goes to the front in the Travers. Now, it was over a wet track, so maybe he hated it. This is a really interesting read from a speed figure standpoint, because both Bayer and Thurograph have him regressing pretty substantially. Time form... If you look at his pace figs, he almost ran a carbon copy in the Travers that he did in the Curlin. In the Curlin, he went 130, 128, 120, 116. In the Travers, he went 130, 129, final time 115. Now, you can look at that one of two ways and say, that's not fast enough to win in here, which I, I, I'm not going to really argue. I think he does need to improve. Or you can look at it and say, if you go through and look at his past performances, I always talk about paired up buyer tops. Three and four starts back. He pairs up 94, so he moves up to a 99 in the curling. Now, the, the interesting thing there is the 116 timeform U.S. rating is not factoring in the pace scenario, right? If you go to the timeform U.S. figs, that number is a 119. He comes back in the Travers regresses on buyer, regresses on thoroughgraph. On time form, if you factor the pace in, he effectively pairs up tops, 119 and 120. So I'm I'm of the opinion, I talk about the buyer tops, because the buyers are, I would say, the most widely used commercially available speed figures. But to me, whether it's thoroughgraph, you know, you're looking at patterns, buyer, but time form as well. I think he can improve here, and I do wonder if he was on the lead just based on the way that race looked like it was going to play out on paper, the Travers. And you can even say that about the Curlin. But I believe he actually is probably better with a target. So now that brings into play, you're going to have Saudi Crown go. You probably have Magic Tap relatively close. I brought up Reincarnate from the far outside. Figures like he's got to go. And Gilmore stretches back out in distance. I can't imagine him sitting off of it. Well, now all of a sudden, if you're, I don't know, fifth down the back stretch, maybe he hates a wet track. I have no idea. But if I backed him at sevens, I got to back him at nine to two or five to one here. So I'm, I'm going to go with Scotland. In the Pennsylvania Derby, I still believe in this horse. I, I've been a believer from day one. And for me, this is, I went through this race many, many times. And I was like, God, what the, what, the, what are you going to do? And I practice what you preach. One bad race does not make a horse in total. He didn't run great in the Travers. But you know what? That doesn't mean that he's a bum. I'm going right back to him. Scotland for me in the Pennsylvania Derby. Let me know your thoughts on Twitter at Bernie or underscore Matt or beneath the video player on YouTube. A Colt for me in the Cotillion, Scotland for me in the Pennsylvania Derby. Now, NFL, week three. Let me pull up the old projections. Mentioned at the top of the show, correctly identified the tie. I have another one this week. Not saying it's going to happen. But keep in mind, you can bet these games three-way. You should be betting at the FanDuel Sportsbook, wherever it's available. But you can bet these games three-way. You can bet them in in the tie. So I mentioned that Thursday night, which is coming gone, but just for record's sake. And also, as I said last week, I'm probably not diving in deep until next week where we have another week's worth of data, or maybe even after week four, because my player model right now is very rough. There's just not enough data to truly draw major conclusions. This is a blend of power ratings for this year and for last year. I don't really add in the eye test sort of thing. I'm using old uh, road sort of disadvantage numbers as far as like home field is concerned. I'm at 1.9 points. You could make the argument that so far this year, it's actually considerably less. 
I know a lot of people still use that old like three rule of thumb for home field advantage. I think that's way outdated. I think it's a fraction of that now. Again, I'm operating off of 1.9. I know some folks are even less than that. I'm not ready to go that far, but we'll wait and see. Um, and I'll start really getting into sort of record keeping next week. Thursday night, I had San Francisco 29, New York 20. Ended up being 30 to 12. It, I mean, it looked like a gross game on paper, and it was a gross game in general. So let's go. Right in order. Atlanta Falcons at Detroit Lions. I have Detroit winning 25 to 22. Buffalo Bills at Washington Commanders. I've got Buffalo winning 29 to 20. This right now is a game that I'm actually tempted to bet. Uh, last I had seen, it was six and a half. I don't really want to let it get to seven. If it stays six and a half, I would dive in on that one. Even though they're on the road, I'm just not fully committed yet to the Commanders being all that in a bag of chips. I'm just not. Indianapolis at Baltimore. I've got Baltimore winning 25 to 16. Denver at Miami. I expected this number to be bigger, but I've got Miami winning 26 to 19. Houston at Jacksonville. I have Jacksonville winning 25 to 16. New Orleans at Green Bay, very close, but I've got Green Bay winning 23 to 21. The Patriots at the Jets. Now, if you're just an eye test person, I I have first things first. I have New England winning 22 to 21. When I watch the Jets offense and I watch the Patriots defense, I have a hard time seeing the Jets scoring more than 10 points. But I'm going with the numbers. And it's still early enough that I don't want to get too crazy with anything. Um, but I believe I had looked at that and that was almost 3-1 to one or 5-2, to two, something like that. Jets under 10, 10 points or less. I'm, I'm not going to touch it. The Patriots are, are very difficult right now to read. Not that they're difficult to play, but on defense they are. I digress. Titans at Browns. I've got the Browns winning 22-19. to Chargers at Vikings. This one pains me to say this, but I've got the Vikings winning 25-24. to Carolina at Seattle. I've got Seattle winning 23-19. to The Bears at the Chiefs. I've got the Chiefs winning 29-18. to Cowboys at the Cardinals. I've got Dallas winning 29-16. to Pittsburgh, Las Vegas. Sunday night football. I teased it. 21 to 21. 21 to 21. Do with that what you will. You know what? I'm going to let me pull up something right now. Let's head on over to the FanDuel Sportsbook. Let's get a line on this. NFL. Sunday night football. Will there be overtime? Yes, plus 1,400. I'm not telling you, again, the, the likelihood of being correct with this sort of move two weeks in a row for calling for an overtime game, you know, highly unlikely. Plus 1,400. Maybe just a little sprinkle. Or if you want to do something a little bit different too, let's say you like one of these other teams early on and you want to just kind of get crazy, right? You can play first half winner, end of regulation winner, and you can parlay that together. FanDuel's got that available. So if you like the Steelers to win the first half and you're going to kind of buy into this 21-21 projection, you can play a Steelers tie, that's 29 to 1, or you can play a Raiders tie, that's 34 to 1. Just throwing out some random things. Doesn't always have to be cookie cutter. Doesn't have to be that simple. But I've got 21-21 as a projection for Sunday night football. Monday night. I still don't why are they doing this? There's two games. Eagles at Bucks. I've got Philly winning 26 to 21, and I still I truly don't want to. Well, that's what the number. That's what I've got. I don't want to believe that Tampa's any good. I know they've got players, but I just and Phil, if Philly were firing on all cylinders, I just refuse to believe this is. I think what was the game, four and a half, something like that. And then the Rams at the Bengals, I would tread very lightly with this one. I've got Cincinnati 25, LA 21. I don't know what to make of either of these teams, specifically Cincinnati. I think I think something's a little bit wrong there, but we'll wait and see. Joey B's got banged up again, and we'll see what happens. But those are the projections for week three in the National Football League. Uh, as a reminder, I'm off next week, so there won't be projections. There won't be any, any pod, period. But that'll give me another week's worth of data. We can wrap that in, and then the next pod will either come just before I leave 
for Lexington or once I get to Lexington for opening weekend of the fall meeting at Keeneland. Keeneland, yeah, woo! Looking forward to it. However you listen, thank you for doing so. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and themoneypodcast.com. Also, YouTube, search bar map or your show. You'll get this episode along with the 172 prior. Please rate, review, subscribe, thumbs up, thumbs down, five-star rating, all that jazz. Pennsylvania Derby, Cotillion, going to be a wet one. FanDuel TV, you can watch those races live. I will be there, hopefully not soaking wet. I'm bringing, i got to pack all the rain gear. You name it, it's all going to be there. Galoshes, scuba gear, whatever else, because it looks like it's going to be rather wet. At the end of the day, though, these are my opinions. Your opinion is the only one that matters. It's your money. Bet it however you would like. Best of luck however you play, whatever you play, and wherever you play. It's been episode 173 of the Matt Burnier Show.